Imagine you are standing on an uninhabited island and dozens and hundreds of slippery crawling bodies are rustling around you. You start to choke with fear. Your heart is racing. You look around and see snakes. They are everywhere you look, even on the trees. It seems like you are in a nightmare, but you are not. This is just one of the scariest places on our planet, and there are many more of them. We have picked for you the top places you'd better never go to. 15 Most Dangerous Places in the World Don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel to make sure you don't miss our videos. At first glance, it looks like a paradise island with palm trees and a sunny climate. And the name Bikini Atoll surely reminds you of something. Yes, yes, the action of the famous Nickelodeon animated series SpongeBob SquarePants mainly takes place in the fictional underwater town of Bikini Bottom, which is supposedly located under Bikini Atoll. But this island actually has a very grim history. The atom bomb is here. It exists. We must look to the future. Up until now, only three have been exploded, and none over the water. It was here on Bikini Atoll in the Marshall Islands that the U.S. conducted nuclear weapons tests from 1946 to 1958. And just nearby, on Eniwatok Atoll, the first hydrogen bomb was tested on November 1st, 1952. Bikini was chosen because of its remote location and spacious and easily accessible lagoon, and the inhabitants were asked to move to a neighboring atoll. After a council with elders, the ruler Paramount Eroj of Bikini inhabitants agreed, and 167 indigenous inhabitants moved to Rongeric Atoll. Unfortunately, the trees and palms of the new home were not so fruitful. Fresh water was not enough, and there were food poisoning cases. The Bikini Atoll's indigenous people were subsequently relocated several more times. But back to the tests. The operation in 1946 was called Crossroads. It involved dozens of warships and airplanes, 25,000 radiation meters, and thousands of laboratory animals were brought to the atoll. There were two tests, codenamed Abel and Baker. During Abel, a bomb was dropped on 73 warships, and the 21 kiloton Baker bomb, dubbed the Helen of Bikini, exploded at a depth of 27 meters, 88.6 feet. Feel what happened at that moment. Two million tons of water, sand, and powdered coral exploded into the air. The explosion literally shredded the ocean bottom. Scientists who examined it 73 years later found that it had never leveled out. The target ships and the atoll as a whole were heavily contaminated with radioactive material. But at the time, few people realized how severe the contamination would be. Years later, the level of radiation from the impact has significantly decreased but the problem of contamination from the sunken ships remains. It was just that during the tests, the ships had to be left in full combat readiness. That is, they still had fuel and ammunition. As a result, fuel continues to leak from the Japanese Navy's flagship, Nagato, spreading for miles. The third bikini test, codenamed Castle Bravo, took place in 1954. A hydrogen bomb was detonated over the atoll. The explosion was 1,000 times more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Up to 100 Japanese schooners were exposed to radiation, and 457 tons of tuna were spoiled. 192 kilometers, 119 miles from Bikini, radiation levels reached 1,000 row engines per hour while 600 row engines is already lethal to humans. Overall, it was the most powerful of the nuclear tests in U.S. history. They continued for another four years, until 1958. As a result, 
Bikini became uninhabitable. The soil and water became contaminated, so that farming and fishing were no longer possible. More than half of the 167 indigenous people of Bikini Atoll died due to severe radiation-related diseases. The U.S. later paid the descendants of the Bikini Atoll's inhabitants $83 million in compensation for damages from nuclear tests and relocation from their home island. There are now four to six caregivers living on the atoll. Now, let's move to another island you'd better also avoid, but for a completely different reason. What could be hiding there? Giant lizards? Aliens? Traces of ancient civilizations? In fact, this place has become a haven for people who have been called devils and bloodthirsty demons. We bet you wouldn't want to encounter them after such a presentation. What makes them so dangerous? Officially, the North Sentinel is governed by India. But in reality, this Andaman Island in the Bay of Bengal, about the size of Manhattan, 58.8 square kilometers, 22.7 square miles, is a real thing in itself. Its inhabitants are the most isolated tribe in the world, unwilling to embrace civilization. Yes, yes, they don't know what the dollar, global warming, and online movie theaters are. The Sentinelese forbid outsiders from coming to their island and kill those who try to get to them. The last time their ferocity was brought up was in 2018. That was when a 26-year-old American missionary, John Chow, who arrived on Sentinel without permission from Indian authorities, tried to land on the island to convert the natives to Christianity. Chow brought a Bible and souvenirs. The indigenous people made signs ordering him to get out. But the young American did not give up and next time, he persuaded the fishermen who had brought him to leave him on the shore. It ended tragically. Chow was shot with an arrow, and the fishermen who saw the guy's body being dragged along the shore were arrested for having brought him there illegally. But even before Chow, encounters with islanders ended badly. In 2006, for example, two fishermen went to the Sentinel to catch crabs. They wanted to negotiate with the islanders, but they killed them immediately. The Sentinelese were not even afraid of the helicopter that came for the bodies and showered it with arrows. This hatred for the iron birds can be explained. Two years before, there was a severe tsunami and the local authorities decided to help the indigenous people. They dropped off food supplies and essentials while accidentally killing one of the Sentinelese with a sack. The issue is complicated by the fact that no one knows or understands the language of the islanders. It is not even known what they call themselves, nor is it known how many people live on the island. This makes the North Sentinel one of the most mysterious places on the planet. Now, India is trying to protect the islanders from outside invasion. By law, it is forbidden to approach the North Sentinel any closer than eight kilometers, five miles. Indian researchers believe that the Sentinelese should just be left alone and allowed to live the way they do. Another reason is that the islanders have no immunity to diseases that are common in the rest of the world. These diseases can simply kill them. But the island and its inhabitants are very interesting for the tourists who visit the neighboring tribes. So can they be protected in the age of globalization? We don't know, but we'd better stay away from them for now. Meanwhile, staying away from the next subject of our top 15 is not so easy, at least for the locals. At the end of August 2010, the Cinnabung Stratovolcano woke up after 400 years of sleep. The giant with a height of 2,460 meters, 8,070 feet, is located in the north of Sumatra Island in Indonesia. People have been settling near it for ages, not realizing how dangerous it is. Indonesia is located on the tectonic faults of the Pacific Ring of Fire and ranks first in the world by the number of volcanoes. There are 147 of them in the country, 
of which 130 are active. And as many as 9 million Indonesians live close to active volcanoes, that is, within 10 kilometers, 6.2 miles from them. Since Cinnabung came out of hibernation, it has erupted almost every year, sometimes several times a year. As a result, airplanes flying through the region have to change their routes. Each eruption is accompanied by the evacuation of between 6,000 and 20,000 locals. But sometimes, things end tragically. In 2014, for example, this fire-breathing monster took at least 16 lives because people living within 5 kilometers, 3.1 miles from it, were allowed to return home when they thought the eruption had stopped. But shortly after, the volcano erupted again. A journalist who wanted to take a closer shot was killed, as were four children from a local school, along with a teacher who decided to observe the eruption. In 2016, the volcano killed seven more people and seriously injured three others. And it was an epic show when it woke up. A column of ash and smoke rose to a height of three kilometers, 1.9 miles. 12,000 residents of surrounding villages had to be evacuated from their homes. But that proved to be just the beginning. In the evening of the same day, the outbursts continued. At the same time, an earthquake struck, affecting an area within 25 kilometers, 15.5 miles of the epicenter. A few more days later, Cinnabung fired a third portion of ash. The sound of the explosion could be heard at a distance of 8 kilometers, 5 miles. In 2021, the volcano erupted as many as five times, starting in January and ending in July. Last time, in addition to a 4.5 kilometer, 2.8 mile high column of dust and gas, there were also pyroclastic flows, destructive streams of volcanic debris that spread one kilometer, 0.6 miles from the mouth of the volcano. They outpace even airplanes in speed, reaching 700 kilometers per hour, 435 miles per hour, and their temperatures reach 800 degrees Celsius, 1,472 degrees Fahrenheit, which is deadly to any living creatures in the vicinity. But we've had enough of high temperatures. Let's move to the coldest inhabited place on Earth. The pipes freeze here, so most toilets are outbuildings with no water supply. The ground also freezes, and there are very few plants, so you would have to eat mostly meat and fish, sometimes in frozen form. Vegetarians, this is not the right place for you. The engines here freeze so fast that they are not turned off sometimes, even at night. And when you walk on the street, your eyelashes get covered with frost. It's a place where winter is coming all the time. Welcome to Oymayakan, a remote Yakut village in eastern Siberia near the Arctic Circle. In 1924, the temperature dropped to a record low of minus 71.2 degrees Celsius, minus 96.2 degrees Fahrenheit. The average winter temperature is minus 50 degrees Celsius, minus 58 degrees Fahrenheit. The village itself was founded in the 1920s. Here, shepherds used to water their reindeer from the thermal spring in winter. During the shortest days of the year, the night in Oymayakan lasts 21 hours. Every March, the village hosts the Pole of Cold Festival, which is the name given to the areas with the lowest temperatures. According to beliefs, the festival is held by Chaiskan, the Yakut spirit of cold. He looks like something between Gandalf and the Ice Queen from Frozen. In summer, the temperatures in Oymayakan can reach 35.5 degrees Celsius, 96 degrees Fahrenheit. However, the daily temperature swings are large, and it can be 15 to 20 degrees Celsius, 59 to 68 degrees Fahrenheit cooler at night than it is during the day. No wonder that the pole of cold has become a point of attraction for record lovers. In 2019, for example, 
Oymayakan hosted the world's first ever race in record low temperatures. At the time of the start, the temperature was minus 48 degrees Celsius, minus 54.4 degrees Fahrenheit. It lasted four hours, and during this time, runners covered several different distances. The participants were from France, India, Italy, Austria, and Taiwan. A resident of Japan also dared to do an extreme act. He bathed in Oymayakan in the river at a temperature of minus 60 degrees Celsius, minus 76 degrees Fahrenheit. The man ran out of the van in his underwear, plunged into the water several times, and came back. His photo was later posted on YouTube and gained over 200,000 views. It's chilling to even look at, isn't it? This one of the most dangerous places in the world has also become one of the most romantic ones at the same time. Swiss Patrick Bauman proposed to his French girlfriend, Anne Severine Boulard. The couple came to Oymayakan specifically for this purpose and made a movie about it. However, Anne couldn't put the ring on because of the frost. I hope you didn't get too cold here because we're moving on back to one hot place. If you are looking for an adrenaline rush, this is the place for you. The Donakil Desert stretches over 136,956 square kilometers, 52,879 square miles across Ethiopia, Eritrea, and Djibouti. So you don't have to go to space at all to see Martian landscapes. Here in the Donakil Desert, they are formed by salt deposits. The Afar people who inhabit this area have been mining salt for centuries. It was used as currency in Ethiopia until the 20th century. Its thick deposits, in some places up to 800 meters, 2,625 feet deep, and the petrified corals that have been found here suggest that there used to be an ocean on the place of this desert. And imagine, you are standing under the ruthless sun, feeling the salt brought by the wind on your lips and inhaling the air filled with poisonous gases. Yes, yes, even breathing in the Donakil Desert is harmful. That's because the air contains high concentrations of poisonous sulfur vapors. Therefore, researchers believe that even a short stay in this desert can impact health. The temperature is no less dangerous. During the day, it exceeds 50 degrees Celsius, 122 degrees Fahrenheit, and generally, it rarely falls below this mark. There is only 25 millimeters, one inch of rainfall per year. No wonder it is one of the hottest and most lifeless places in the world. Part of the desert is the Donakil Depression, one of the lowest places on the planet. It is 125 meters, 410 feet below sea level. On winter mornings, the temperature here may well fluctuate around 37 degrees Celsius, 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, and the overall maximum temperature is 63 degrees Celsius, 145.4 degrees Fahrenheit. It is not for nothing that British researcher Wilfred Thesiger called the Donakil Desert the land of death. And a group of researchers in 2016 studied whether microbes could live in reservoirs of boiling water found in the Donakil Desert. This way, they wanted to find out whether similar organisms could survive on Mars. And it turned out that these organisms could survive in such a harsh environment. But you wouldn't like these hot springs. Their water has an average pH of 0.2, which means it's about as acidic as battery acid. The Donakil Desert is also a volcanically active area. Here, just in the depression, there is a dormant volcano, Ayelu, and active volcanoes, Dalal and Irtale. Who knows when they will decide to erupt? All this increases the risk of staying in this place, adding points to its dangerous reputation. Nevertheless, tourists actively strive to come here, despite the dangers or maybe just because of them. In the next place of our top 15, breathing is no less difficult. If you decide to stay here for longer than 10 minutes, you can get heat stroke and your lungs can fill up with fluid. 
No, you are not on the edge of a volcano, but in the Cave of the Crystals in Mexico. The place resembles Superman's Fortress of Solitude. The cave was discovered in 2000. A mining company called Industrias Peñoles in the Mexican state of Chihuahua pumped water out of it. And two brothers, miners Juan and Pedro Sanchez, were amazed when their flashing lights caught the glow of giant crystals. No, not Swarovski, out of the darkness. But they were no less beautiful. It was selenite, a crystalline variety of gypsum. These were real columns you could walk on. Many crystals were 4 to 6 meters, 13.1 to 19.6 feet long, and the largest were 11 meters, 36 feet. They were about 1 meter, 3.2 feet thick. How did this amazing natural masterpiece form? The crystals grew for at least 500,000 years at a depth of 300 meters, 984 feet beneath the Sierra de Naica. Tectonic fault lines run through this area. About 26 million years ago, magma began to move through them, and eventually the mountain was formed, and the cave itself is a U-shaped cavity in the limestone under the mountain. For tens of thousands of years, it was filled with groundwater. It contained the mineral and hydrite. The magma beneath the cave kept the water hot, but eventually its temperature dropped to just under 58 degrees Celsius, 136 degrees Fahrenheit, and the anhydrite began to break down in the new conditions, decomposing into calcium and sulfate. The particles began to slowly form a crystalline form of gypsum, otherwise known as selenite. The cave began to fill with selenite crystals. They stayed underwater and grew steadily. Of course, they didn't turn into giants overnight. For example, it takes 500,000 to 900,000 years for a crystal with a diameter of 1 meter, 3.2 feet, to grow. By the way, this cave with selenite was not the first one discovered. In 1910, another cavity was found 120 meters, 394 feet, above the Cave of the Crystals at a depth of 120 meters. 394 feet. It was called the Cave of Swords because its crystals resembled these cold weapons, but the selenite outgrowths in it were much smaller, no more than 2.5 meters, 8.2 feet long. Most probably the reason for this is that the Cave of Swords cooled down much faster, and the crystals simply did not have time to grow larger. However, this beauty can also be deadly. It is rumored that one guest to the giant crystal's cave was literally impaled by a satellite spike from the vault when he tried to break it off. The atmosphere itself can kill you here. The temperature in this wonder of the world is around 47.1 degrees Celsius, 113 degrees Fahrenheit, and the humidity is almost 100%. Therefore, it is impossible to stay here for long without special clothing. In 2017, the pumping of water stopped, so the crystals can start to grow again. Mere mortals are still not allowed to enter this place. Well, we are going to move to another hard to reach and harsh place. And don't be surprised if you notice suspiciously many dead animals and birds here. This place in Kamchatka is called the Death Valley and it really deserves this name. The bodies of wolverines, foxes, stellar sea eagles, lynxes, wolves, gophers, mice, hares, and ermines have been found in this area, and the list is only growing. In fact, the Death Valley is a small area at an altitude of 850 meters, 2,789 feet at the foot of the Kikpinyach volcano in the Kronotsky Nature Preserve. It is about two kilometers, 1.2 miles long, and 100 to 500 meters, 328 to 1,640 feet wide. This place becomes a trap mainly for small mammals and birds. A full chain begins. First, sparrows die. Then, foxes that come for them. Then, wolverines and bears that come for foxes. 
and the birds include crows and golden eagles. What kills the animals and birds? Is there some kind of mystical phenomenon here? In fact, the reason is a high concentration of gases. Hydrogen sulfide, carbon sulfide, and carbon dioxide. They float right above the ground, killing, first of all, small animals. Gas jets rise from great depths. These places can be distinguished by sulfur plaque. Especially many hazardous volatile substances accumulate in cloudy, windless weather in natural niches. There are not so many of them in open terrain, so they are not dangerous. It all starts in late spring. The snow on the thermal sites melts and the bare ground attracts birds. They search there for seeds or insects and become victims of poisonous gases that have a nerve agent action and living creatures die within seconds. And then the already mentioned chain starts. But sometimes even large predators are at risk when heavy poisonous gases squeeze the air to a height of up to 50 centimeters. Bodies are preserved for a very long time because bacterial activity is suppressed in the poisonous atmosphere. Researchers have estimated that since 1975, that is, since the valley was discovered, about 25 bears have died because of the gas concentration. And between 1975 and 1983, reserve staff collected more than 200 animal bodies. There were 12 species of mammals and 15 species of birds among them. By the way, herbivorous animals die much more rarely here because the slopes have no vegetation and therefore do not attract them. And how would these gases affect you? You would feel pain and heat in the back of your neck, dizziness, it would be difficult to breathe, and there would be a bad taste in your mouth. But once you could stand in a ventilated area, you'd feel better again pretty soon. But you would definitely not feel good anywhere near the next object in our top 15. Steep paths on its slopes are dangerous. Sulfur gases are poisonous. And occasional gas releases have taken the lives of many miners. We're talking about Asian Volcano on the island of Java in Indonesia. It is a whole complex consisting of more than a dozen volcanic sites around a caldera, that is, a hollow. These are stratovolcanoes, craters, volcanic cones. Here, you can see an amazing show. The volcano slopes are enveloped in blue flames. How does it happen? Hot and flammable sulfuric gases are emitted from fumaroles, i.e. cracks. Their temperature reaches 600 degrees Celsius, 1,112 degrees Fahrenheit. When they come into contact with oxygen in the air, they ignite and begin to burn with an electric blue flame. Some of the gas condenses in the atmosphere and forms streams of molten sulfur, which also burn with blue fire. You can admire the unusual landscape at night. In the daytime, it is little noticeable. Also in the caldera, there is a sulfurous lake, Kawa Ijin. The water in it is of turquoise color, although sometimes it changes its shade during the day. This color is caused by extreme acidity and high concentration of dissolved metals. This is the largest acid lake in the world. Its pH is only 0.5, while the normal value is 11 to 15 times higher. That is, the lake's acidity is like that of a battery. And if you rinse your mouth with water from it, your teeth will fall out. The reason is the inflow of gas-saturated hydrothermal water from the hot magmatic source below. The lake is 200 meters, 656 feet deep, and one kilometer, 0.6 miles wide. Its shores are a large natural deposit of natural sulfur. When sulfur-containing gases burst from fumaroles, they ignite only if they are hot. But the temperature is often so low that the sulfur condenses, falls to the ground as a liquid, flows, and solidifies. This eventually creates a renewable sulfur deposit. Locals mine it and deliver it to a nearby factory. This is one of the top-paying jobs for country residents. They earn $12 to $17 a day for it. 
but it is also extremely dangerous. The smell of sulfur smoke is very strong. It smells a bit sour and sometimes resembles the smell of fried eggs. If it gets into the mouth or nose, a person begins to suffocate. That's why locals use respirators. Experienced miners may carry a load of sulfur much heavier than their body weight. To get the job done, they have to climb up a steep mountainside and then walk down dangerous rocky paths. To make it easier to collect the sulfur, miners have installed pipes that capture the gases from the numerous fumaroles and direct them to one place. But sometimes even this does not help. In the last 40 years, 74 miners have died because of smoke that suddenly escaped the cracks in the rock. The next place on our top 15 list has no sulfur, but many other threats. Do you think beauty cannot be deadly? This statement is refuted by the Death Valley National Park in California. This is one of the most popular places among tourists, and yet it harbors a lot of dangers. This area got its name in 1849 during the gold rush. At that time, a group of settlers wanting to get to the gold mines faster decided to take a shortcut through the desert. But one man never made it to the destination. The others crossed the valley, hungry and thirsty, and decided to call it Death Valley. Despite the fact that only one person died here, it was a tragedy for the rest of the people so the name quickly caught on. So what are the dangers? The first is the temperature. Death Valley is the hottest and driest place in North America. Just imagine, this place gets less than five centimeters or two inches of rainfall per year, and the highest recorded temperature is 56.7 degrees Celsius, 134 degrees Fahrenheit. Such extreme temperatures have claimed the lives of many people. In 2023 alone, a 71-year-old man died here due to heat stroke. In winter, the valley is no less dangerous. Temperatures drop to zero and below, and snow and ice can cause sudden flooding on the valley bottom. Wouldn't that stop you from visiting? Then let's move on. The next danger is wild animals, of which there are many in the park so it's best not to check any suspicious places with your hands and feet. Poisonous rattlesnakes with sharp fangs, black widow spiders, and scorpions can lurk there. You may also find desert rabbits, desert tortoises, large lizards, dog-like coyotes, and wild sheep. In general, though, the valley is home to many species of birds, mammals, and reptiles. Another danger is hantavirus, which causes hantavirus pulmonary syndrome. It has been found in Java mouse deer and cactus mice. It is a severe respiratory disease that is fatal for humans. It is spread by rodents or their excrement. So, if you decide to travel to Death Valley, stay away from the huts and mine buildings. There are plenty of rodents there. Another danger is the mines and tunnels you may stumble upon. Don't enter them. We've warned you. There could be explosive gas, foul air, or dangerous wild animals in there. Well, last but not least, we cannot forget to mention the flooding that happens when the rain finally comes. The national park is surrounded by valleys, so flash floods are likely to occur. In 2022, flooding here caused all roads to be closed and hundreds of people were virtually stuck inside Death Valley National Park. But let's move to an area that is no less formidable, where people also have to get used to extreme conditions. Would you risk tasting radioactive octopus or bathing in radioactive water? And some have no choice. On March 11, 2011, a nine-magnitude earthquake struck Japan in the waters of the Pacific Ocean, northeast of Tokyo. It was the most powerful earth tremors in this country in the history of modern observations. They triggered a tsunami, monstrous 30 to 40 meter, 98 to 131 feet high waves demolished houses, cars, and airplanes at airports. The two disasters killed nearly 20,000 people and more than 2,500 are reported missing. 
The earthquake de-energized the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, and the tsunami flooded basements with diesel generators. Emergency cooling systems at the plant failed, and nuclear fuel melted in the reactors of three units. This eventually led to a series of explosions and the release of radioactive substances into the atmosphere. The area remains contaminated to this day. The exclusion zone reaches for 20 to 30 kilometers, 12 to 19 miles. The accident did not outstrip Chernobyl, but it was the worst nuclear power plant disaster of the 21st century. But it could have been avoided. Fukushima Daiichi was built by TEPCO. It was their first nuclear power plant. The initial mistake was building the plant too close to the ocean. And the second mistake was that the maximum designed load was a 7 magnitude earthquake and a 3.1 meter, 10 feet high tsunami. This was despite the fact that seismologists warned of the risk of a massive tsunami in the Fukushima Daiichi area back in 2002. More than 10 years after the accident, Fukushima is gradually recovering. Residents of the hastily abandoned towns are returning home and tourists are already traveling to the local exclusion zone. But if you think that's the end of the problems with Fukushima Daiichi, you're wrong. In order to avoid even worse consequences of the 2011 tsunami, the shutdown nuclear reactors had to be cooled down additionally. Heat is released from them. Because of this, as much as 170 tons of tritium-contaminated water is generated every day. As a result, about 1.3 million tons of radioactive water has accumulated in the plant's tanks. This volume could fill 500 Olympic-sized swimming pools. Since the tanks were full, the water began to be drained into the ocean. Before doing so, TEPCO filters it to remove isotopes other than tritium, which is difficult to separate. This water is then diluted with seawater. They plan to discharge about 460 tons per day. Discharging all the water from the nuclear power plant will take about 30 years. But the country's authorities claim that the fish caught in the vicinity of the nuclear power plant are safe for human health. Japan's prime minister and several ministers even tasted seafood caught off the coast of Fukushima. Would you risk it? Visiting the next location on our list is also risky. And yet, it is extremely popular. On this island, you can get hurt due to various factors. Car accidents, drowning, broken neck due to diving in shallow water, and snake bites. Also, great white sharks are often seen close to the shore of the eastern part of the island. An additional danger is posed by the strong currents. You are on Fraser Island, or Kagari as the locals call it. With 500,000 tourists visiting the island every year, it's hard to believe that it has so many dangers when you look at its idyllic beauty. Alas, beauty and danger go side by side here. Dreadful tides are a regular occurrence here, but it's the local wildlife that's the most dangerous. There are small blue bottles living around the island. These are jellyfish, which have a distinctive blue color. They sting 10,000 people each year across Australia. When they sting, they release a poison that causes severe pain, fever, and even death. Blue bottles often come in groups and can sting even if they have been washed ashore. The Irukandji jellyfish are even more dangerous. These are the smallest jellyfish. They are only one cubic centimeters, 0.06 cubic inches in size but are extremely venomous. Their toxin causes a condition known as Irukandji syndrome. It sends over 50 people to hospitals every year with the threat of fatal brain hemorrhage. Another dangerous inhabitant of the island is the wild dingo dog. These animals look very cute, but it's important to remember, these are ferocious creatures, not cute puppies from your neighborhood. There are over 200 dingoes on Fraser, they have attacked tourists several times. There was a case of a young boy who walked away from his family and was attacked and killed by several dingoes in 2001. Plus, the island is home to 18 species of snakes. 
a third of which are venomous and extremely dangerous to humans. These include the eastern brown snake, which is the second most venomous snake in the world. It kills 50 to 60 people a year. Where else would you find such a heavenly place with so many dangers? Now, let's move to another continent, to the peak. The risk of avalanches, ice falls, simple falls, hypothermia, extreme fatigue and exhaustion, and illnesses associated with very low oxygen content. This is what the brave hearts on Everest face. Of all deaths of foreign mountaineers while climbing Everest, 35% were due to falls, 22% due to exhaustion, 18% due to altitude sickness, and 13% due to hypothermia. In the vast majority of cases, climbers have bad luck during the descent, either after successfully reaching the summit or after turning back before reaching the summit. The culprits here are extreme fatigue or prolonged exposure to extremely low oxygen conditions. The Sherpa, i.e. Nepalese mountain guides, are more likely to die on the lower parts of the climb because they spend a lot of time preparing the route and get injured. Why do people take such risks? Let us remind you that Mount Everest is the highest peak in the world. Its summit is 8,849 meters, 29,032 feet above sea level. May 29, 2023 is the 70th anniversary of the first successful ascent of Mount Everest but 2023 was also one of the deadliest years in the history of records. A total of 12 climbers died, and several more went missing. And that's despite the fact that almost all people climbing Everest undergo special training and prepare for physical, psychological, and technical difficulties. Such preparation can take months or even years. They acclimatize, sleep in tents at altitude, or train in chambers that simulate a low oxygen environment. They also climb other summits exceeding 6,000 meters, 19,685 feet. The top of the mountain, that is the area above 7,925 meters, 26,000 feet, is called the death zone. There is little oxygen there, so climbers feel drowsy, disoriented, and tired, and things feel heavier. In other words, despite extensive training, the risks are still there and climbers die every season. According to the Himalayan database, more than 310 people have lost their lives on Everest in 100 years, from 1922 to 2022. During that time span, 16,000 non-Sherpa climbers attempted to ascend the summit. More than a third of them, 5,633 people succeeded. By the way, on their way up, they all had a terrible sight waiting for them, the bodies of their less successful fellow climbers. In total, there are about 200 bodies on Everest, which serve as a grim warning to others. It is dangerous to try to remove them. Several rescuers died trying to do so, so most climbers lie where they fell. Speaking of falls, we cannot fail to mention the next place. Year after year, people die here. Some seek adventure, some depend on this road, but it's a risky trip for all of them. The Road of Death, or formerly Camino Las Yungas, is a section of road between the cities of La Paz and Coroico. It is narrow and rocky, averaging 3.2 meters, 10 feet in width. There is a cliff on one side and a terrible abyss on the other. Travelers on the road of death experience steep serpentines and sharp turns. It is dangerous to drive here at any time of the year. In summer, there are often rock falls, and dust reduces visibility. The rainy season is from November to March. Water erodes the clayish surface, making it slippery and unstable. Some places are difficult for even one car to pass, and virtually impossible for two. There are no guardrails or deceleration lanes. That's why cars stop, drivers get out, and agree how to pass one another. However, not only cars, but also bicyclists are at risk here. Even excursions are dangerous. 
At least 18 tourists have died here since 1998. This path has been officially recognized as the most dangerous in the world. An average of 26 buses and cars have fallen here each year, killing dozens and even hundreds of people. The most terrible case occurred in 1983. Residents of La Paz were returning home after the holiday in Coroico. There were many of them, and the driver boarded the bus with twice as many passengers as it was supposed to carry. As a result, the vehicle tilted on a narrow curve and fell off a cliff. The road of death then took 100 lives. It is also creepy to drive on this road because there are crosses at every turn in memory of the dead. Bolivians call them warning signs. The breaking point was in 2007 when an alternative road, a modern safe highway, was opened between La Paz and Coroico. Now the old one is hardly used for its intended purpose. It has become a tourist attraction and a source of adrenaline. But let's leave this dangerous road and move to another risky elevation. It looks like a modest peak in the northeastern United States, but it has actually claimed more lives than any other mountain in the country. That's 160 people since record keeping began in 1849. Native Americans call it the home of the Great Spirit. So why is Mount Washington so dangerous? To begin with, it is far from being the highest mountain in the US. Its height is only 1,917 meters, 6,288 feet. Nevertheless, it is popular among tourists. It is visited by up to 250,000 people a year. This is in spite of the extremely unfavorable weather on it, which is often called the worst weather in the world. In 1934, the observatory registered a record wind speed of 372 kilometers per hour, 231 miles per hour. That's faster than high-speed trains. Nowadays, hurricane winds blow on the mountain roughly every four days. Another factor is the low temperatures. It often reaches minus 45.6 degrees Celsius, minus 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the summit. Therefore, tourists often get hypothermia and frostbite. In addition to winds, there is abundant precipitation. The mountain gets 711 centimeters, 280 inches of snow annually. It can cover the trails even in July. Rain and fog are also common occurrences here. You wouldn't be able to see your own feet or an outstretched arm in such weather. The matter is complicated by the fact that even with terrible weather at the top, it can be warm and sunny at the foot of the mountain. So unprepared tourists dare to hike. They end up getting tired and exhausted very quickly, staying dehydrated and stressed out in the ever-changing weather conditions. So the next danger after weather is being unprepared for hiking and proximity to urban centers doesn't help here. For example, you may well wake up in Boston at 5 a.m. and drive to Mount Washington for a day hike instead of serious preparation, and that would be unwise. In the case of Mount Washington, preparation means not only training for better physical fitness and layered clothing, but also being prepared to abandon plans and return earlier than planned if the weather turns bad. But while the mountain, despite the winds, can be visited, you can only get to the last place in our top 15 with us. However, it is better not to go there at all. Every year, snakes kill thousands of people around the world, but the average person rarely crosses paths with snakes. However, there is a place in the world that is literally teeming with them. This is the island called Ilha da Quimada Grande, 20 miles from Sao Paulo in southeastern Brazil, or Snake Island. It is believed that 400,000 snakes lived there in the past. People thought there was one snake for every square meter, but this is most likely a myth. In fact, such a large number of reptiles can't feed themselves in such a small area. There are now no more than 4,000 to 5,000 snakes on the island, but it's still best not to go there although the Brazilian government has already closed access to it. 
Most of the inhabitants of the island, about 2,400 to 2,900 specimens, are golden lancehead viper. It is only found there. This reptile is a close relative of the Ferdy Lance, one of the deadliest snakes in the Americas. The death rate from golden lancehead viper's venom is 7%. This figure is not the highest, but you would hardly want to try your luck in this way. By the way, there are no recent cases of lethal outcomes thanks to the prohibition of the authorities to visit the island. Thanks to the prohibition of the authorities to visit the island. Still, if a person is bitten by a golden lancehead viper, he or she will suffer severe pain, internal bleeding, necrosis of muscle tissue, risk of cerebral hemorrhage, and possibly death if help is not provided in time. No wonder people wanted to get rid of such a neighborhood. So, in the beginning of the 20th century, they tried to clear the territory on the island for banana plantations, burning the forest. But the snakes literally stood up in defense of their home. They attacked the workers, and eventually, the people retreated. Once upon a time, according to the most popular theory, it was humans who evicted the snakes to Ilha da Quimada Grande. This happened 9,000 to 11,000 years ago, after the last ice age. Back then, the island was connected to the mainland by a narrow neck of land. It's along this neck of land that the snakes retreated from the advancing humans. Then this neck of land became submerged, and the snakes remained on Ilha da Quimada Grande. But there is another version, which is appreciated by fans of fairy tales. According to it, pirates buried treasures on the island. To protect them, they inhabited it with venomous snakes, which eventually multiplied greatly. Another legend dates back to the early 20th century and concerns the former keeper of the lighthouse, which now works automatically, and his family. It is said that the snakes set off a massive attack on them. The reptiles got into the bedroom through the windows and started biting people. People fled into the forest, where they died after being attacked by hundreds of snakes. But there is no confirmation of all these stories, and it should be noted that the population of snakes on the island has decreased significantly due to lack of food. At first, they multiplied by simply eating all the small animals in the area, and then the food became scarce. The species is now in the Red Book and is protected because it is endemic. It does not live anywhere else but on this island. There are many dangerous places in the world where people face various threats. However, they can be mesmerizingly beautiful, which only makes them even more dangerous. Whether it is a mountain or an island, a cave or a volcano, each of them bears a terrible secret, sometimes beyond the reach of mere mortals.